بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين جل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرني من ظلمات الوه وأكرمني بنور الفه اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين الحمد لله today we are having our session from Montreal and I hope inshallah the distance would not be a problem and we would be able to communicate inshallah properly you remember we were discussing different aspects of human nature and we talked already about human dignity and the value and respect for human life now we want to move on to a very important discussion and that is about the way human beings choose issues such as free will and then later qada and qadar divine decree and measure inshallah will be discussed in this unit the first thing to start with today is about the desires the inclinations the motivations that we have because we would not be able to understand the way we make decisions and we choose between different things unless we know human desires and the way they function to make everything very simple and brief we make a distinction here between qarida and fitra alhamdulillah in the first uh, you know section that we discussed unit two because we didn't uh, study unit one was for your self-study unit two remember when we were talking about argument of fitra we talked uh, in details about fitra and what are different characteristics of those things which are fitri or innate so alhamdulillah we already have covered that so we don't need to go into those discussion again i i hope you remember them but just very briefly because we needed for the understanding of issue of free will we say there is a difference between gharida and fitra in human beings we have gharida like animals of course our gharida or instincts are in some aspects maybe weaker than animals because gariza for animals instincts for animal is the only thing that they have uh, therefore they have to manage everything based on instincts for example animals know how to make their shelter through instincts how to look after their children through instincts but human beings don't know these things through instincts we know to very limited extent we have to learn we have to educate ourselves so their instincts can be much more comprehensive and detailed than us but we have basics of instincts in addition we have fitra which is very important and that is a set of understanding and desires that we have as human beings no matter which part of the world we live or are born or raised which gender which race which color we as human beings share in our humanity some fetri or innate form of understanding and desires and what is important for us is 
not to base our life, not to base our decisions only on instincts. Very simple example in the book, you know, for example, there is an example. Imagine if you are thirsty and you have a cup of water. So your instinct says you should take this water to quench your thirst. No matter whether there is another person also who needs this or not. This is what animals do also. If there is a little food or you know drink, they don't offer it to other people or other animals. They take it. But our fitra says, if you see there is a person in need of water, you should share your water with that person. Or maybe if he is more thirsty, you should give your water completely to that person. So you have here a choice to make, to take all the water for yourself and drink all the water through your instincts or to share it or give it to other people through your fetra. I'm not saying that instincts are immoral. Please, please be very careful. Uh, inshallah, sometime in future, I may have a very detailed discussion for you about desire, uh, which is part of my PhD. Uh, and it takes time to de classify different desires that you have. But very briefly, I would like to tell you that we don't have bad desires as such. There is no desire in human being that can only be satisfied in immoral ways. We don't have such desires. Our desires are either desires that we have as animals, desires that we have through instinct, which are not immoral but they can be neutral. You have desire for food. You don't have desire for haram food. You don't have desire for harmful food. You have desire for food. But how to respond to that, that's up to you. So here also, when you have water, a cup of water, and you are thirsty, it's not that you have desire for not giving this to other people. But you have a desire for water which is neutral to moral observations. And therefore, if someone is just functioning on the level of gharizah, is not trying to go out of gharizah and think about moral concerns the conclusion that this person makes is to keep the water for himself it's not anything wrong there is nothing wrong with our gariza but it is wrong that we only base our choice on gariza but inside us we have desire which is not animal desire which is not based on gariza this is based on fitrah that Allah has given to human beings the desire for sharing, muwasat. A human being is not like an animal who only gets pleasure by drinking water or food, eating food. A human being can get actually greater pleasure from offering the little that he has to other people. So, this type of desires are moral in nature because they are human. You may remember once we had this discussion that everything which is human, which means something exclusive to human being, not found in animals, has moral direction, is good. It's not even neutral, it's good. You may, again, turn it to bad things. That's another issue. For example, desire for knowledge by itself is good. It's not neutral. It's not like desire for food. But even desire for knowledge can be mis 
oriented and even that can become bad even desire for worship desire for god can be misoriented and sometimes become selfish so we have the ability to make even good things bad let alone use neutral things in bad ways but this has two sides at the same time we can make neutral things even good let alone keeping good things good so this is up to us totally up to us so in human beings there are desires which originate from our fitra which is that part of our essence which is exclusive to us allah has given us through our creation and we have desires which are related to that aspect of being which we share with animals allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 30 verse 30 talks about fitrah you are already familiar with this because when we were talking about fitrah i recited this ayah and this is the ayah that actually has inspired muslim scholars to use term fitrah a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim fa'aqim wajhaka lid-din hanifan fitrat allah allati fatara an-nas 'alayha la tabdila li khalq allah ذلك الدين القيم ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون. الله سبحانه وتعالى says set your face towards religion while you are Hanif means turning away from falsehood to truth and this is فطرة الله. This is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you. And there is no alteration in this. This is part of our nature. This is our fabric. This is the upright religion. But the majority of people don't know, unfortunately. They don't get right to the core of the way that they have been created. Many people remain just on the surface of life. And surface of human life is not very much different from animals. There is much more to discover when you go deeper and deeper. Okay, now the question is, how are we going to work within a framework of desires that we have. Before I go into the discussion about free will, there is a story in the book that might be nice to share with. This is from Mathnavi by Mawlavi Jalaluddin Muhammad Balkhi Rumi is normally known as Rumi in the West or Mawlavi as we call he, in his book Mathnavi he says that there was a garden which had lots of fruits maybe cherries a person was very impressed by these nice looking cherries or fruits and without getting permission from the gardener climbed one of these trees and started eating from that tree the gardener realized and went to him and said are you a thief he said no then look at what he said. He said, I am a servant of God. I am created by God. And this tree is created by God. These fruits are created by God. 
a creature of God is eating creature of God. Nothing is wrong here. So he wanted to basically justify his theft by saying everything is in the end going back to Allah. What he has created is doing something with what he has created. So this gardener was clever. He must have had some studies. So he said, now let's give him a good lesson. So he took a stick or piece of wood or something else and started beating that person. That person started shouting and screaming and say, why you are hitting me? He said, nothing strange has happened. A servant of God with this creature of God is hitting another creature of God. Why you are, you know, worried? So that person realized how mistaken he was. And he said, you know, Toba, I want to repent. I made mistake. So unfortunately, sometimes what we see is people don't want to accept responsibility over what they do. And in order to make them free from any responsibility, they want to say, we have no freedom. We are predestined. We are forced to do things. But this is not acceptable. So sometimes people, because they want to have immoral life, sometimes people, because they are weak, they have always failed, they have not been able to finish anything properly, they also think that, uh, you know, they have no freedom. But there are people who are determined to do things properly. There are people who make success after success. These people never say, you know, we are predestined. Because they know that this is the result of their efforts efforts and the result of their own hard work. Of course, there are also many other factors that should help us to be successful. But basically what I'm saying, a person who plans, who has organized life, who makes decisions properly and stands by his or her decisions, these people normally don't think about jabber or predestination. The people who are lazy, the people who don't want to accept responsibility, the people who have had some failure in their life, maybe by themselves or other people, then maybe these people think about Jabr. Or as we read in the course of history, there were people who had political interest. For example, Bani Umayyah, Umayyads, used to promote the idea of Jabr. Why? In order to tell people that you should not stand against the tyrant Khalifa of your time. If Muawiyah is doing something, it's because of Jabr. Allah gives power and Allah takes away power. You have nothing to do. You may remember some conversations between Ahlul Bayt after the tragedy of Karbala and Ibn Ziyad and Yazid. How Ibn Ziyad and Yazid tried to say whatever happened in Karbala was done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how Ahl al-Bayt responded by saying that this was not something that you can run away from its responsibility. Yes, as Tawheed Af'ali requires unity with respect to actions, everything which takes place is through the will of God, is an action of God. But this doesn't mean that we are not involved. So in the book, there is a um, good analysis that whatever takes place can depend on many, many factors. Imagine, for example, if we need to have light in the room, we need wire. We need uh, electricity. We need bulbs of light. 
we need many different facilities and all of them are needed but we also need someone to switch on the light and to press the button so we are not saying that human beings have hundred percent of the role in their action so that nothing else is needed and we can do whatever we want no what we say is that among different factors that are needed for us to do something freely and voluntarily one is our choice but there are also other things for example you have decided to come to the class today your decision is needed you cannot deny the role of your decision but if other people were not there if there was no transport there was no teacher there was no i don't know security that if you didn't have health if you had uh, some last minute you know problems like to take someone nauzubillah to hospital for example you were not able to come to the class today so we don't deny that there are many other factors that may not be in our hand but definitely one factor is also our decision and those human beings who are successful is not because necessarily they have everything that they want please you know listen to this point very carefully sometimes people think that to be successful to be happy in your life you need everyone helping you everyone you know preparing for you what you want this is not actually the thing that we learn from history the people who have been very successful whether it be in religion whether it be in science in business humanitarian work is not that everything was prepared for them is not that they didn't go through difficulties no these were the people who were put normally in most challenging situations but they were able to find their way out of the difficulties and make sure that they move towards their ideals this is very important so the real intelligence is not just to have ability to quickly understand mathematical questions or philosophical question the real intelligence is how to be able to go out of a status quo your current situation despite all the difficulties that may surround you and move towards your ideals you may be surrounded by people who are good or bad or mixed but still you have to do the best that you can do with these people you may not have enough of resources but do the best with the resources that you have you may not have the best of talents but use your talents in the best way that you can and then you would see within the limited scope that we have for exercising our free will how much we can do a very good example is rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam if you look at the life of rasulullah you don't find that it was a kind of easy comfortable luxury life rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born without seeing his father so he was an orphan even from the birth and even he was not able to be with his mother he had to go as a child with lady halima out of mecca to desert for different reasons part of it was for his safety he had the support of his grandfather and he passed away he had the support of his mother to some years she passed away then in Sheba Abi Talib for three years you know how much he suffered and he lost Lady Khadija he lost, uh, lost Abu Talib 
His life was full of challenges and difficulties. And he was not seeing around him before Islam a society which he was happy with. It. Therefore, he had to go to the cave to be alone, to connect better to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, if you look at the life of Rasulullah, <coughs> you find that it was very, very difficult life. There is a hadith that Rasulullah said, Ma uziya nabiyun mithla ma uzit. No prophet has been annoyed like me. And the problems even after Islam, imagine the pagans did some terrible things. Some of the people of the book, you know, did terrible things. They uh, allied with enemies against Muslims. Some munafiqeen in Medina, they created Masjid al-Zarar, they wanted to assassinate Prophet, they made lots of plots against Islam, and also Prophet knew about insincere intention of some people. So, he, this man suffered more than anyone else, but still he managed to change the whole world. So, great people are not the people for whom everything is prepared and everything is, you know, supporting them. Great people are the people who know how to use everything available in the best possible way. And actually, one of the maybe, you know, um, strange things about this world is that the best decisions can be normally made in the most difficult times. The best decisions are not normally made when everything is going smoothly. So in the time of challenges, you can make a lot. You know, even in business, some of the very rich people are the people that in the time of challenges, in the time of recession, they were able to make big decisions. In politics, it's the same. In everything seems to be the same. That... If you know how to make good decision, wise decision in the time of challenges, you can succeed because that's the time that many people cannot make proper decisions. Like for example, if you are a good driver, your skills would not be shown and demonstrated when everyone is moving on motorway and there is no problem. So a good driver and a bad driver cannot be recognized when everyone is going on a motorway and there is no challenge. But if it is a narrow way in a mountain full of bending and a slippery road and it's raining, then a good driver will be known. So what is important is that we should be able to make the best out of the situation that we have. We human beings always are faced with questions such as, what should I do now? Or why did I do what I did, for example, yesterday? I shouldn't have done it. So we always should reflect on our decisions. Unfortunately, many times people don't take the decision seriously. Let me tell you something. One of the signs of wise people, rational people, people who have hikmah, is that they are very careful about their decisions. You know, simple decisions can sometimes have life-changing impact. For example, going to a meeting, if it is a good meeting, it can change your life for good. If it's a bad meeting, it can change your life for, change your life for bad forever. Saying one word to someone can change your life or that person's life or both lives. You have to be very careful. Never underestimate any decisions. Most of our decisions, if not all, are not reversible. So a Hakim, a rational, a wise person is the one who has full control not only over his actions 
but also over his decisions. Your decisions should not just come out of you. You should have control over your decisions. You know, sometimes people make decisions not consciously. So not only you should be careful about your actions, you should be careful about your decisions. For example, don't make decision when you are in rush. Don't make decisions when you are under pressure. Don't make decision when there are people who are pushing you. Because this is very likely that then you are not able to concentrate and take into account all different factors. So, it's very important for us to be always concerned not only about our actions but also about our decisions this is like helping yourself by going one step further not only think about what you do and say think about the decisions you make for what you do and what you say so inshallah what we are going to do is to talk about free will and then qaza wa qada but just make, I make one point which is in the book because still we have some time and also it can help you for uh, the main discussion which would come inshallah next session. And that is the relation between Allah's knowledge and our will. I am sure you have heard this many times that people say if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything in advance, if he knows everything in eternity, so we are not free. If he knows what I am going to do tomorrow, so I have to do it because he is already aware. This is a question that you may have found many places or many people ask you. And the answer is actually logically it's impossible that knowledge of something affects that thing. Because what is known is the main thing. And knowledge in order, not in time, in order comes after what is known. For example, you are here today in the class and I am aware of it. But am I aware of it because you are here or are you here because I am aware of it? Definitely, you cannot say you are here because I am aware of it. My knowledge comes because of your existence there, your presence there. This knowledge can come at the same time because I'm seeing you right now. This knowledge can come later when I am receiving report of it. Or this knowledge can be before if I know, for example, your plans. Or if I'm able to predict. For example, I know that none of you would be there after five hours. But is it because I know you are going to leave the place? Or is it because you are going to leave the place that I know? If we have, you know, weather forecast. So does our forecast affect weather? Or our forecast is because of weather? So it is true that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows whatever we are doing or we are going to do. For him, there is no past, present, future. He is above the limits of time and space. But this doesn't mean that because of that knowledge, we have to do things. No, because we do things in a particular way and he has no time limit, he knows it. When you are doing something right now, he knows. Is there any problem? No. So the same is with something that you do tomorrow, because for him, there is no past, present and future. And we in our life, we have many experiences of knowing something which is going to happen in future. For example, we know that, you know, sun is going to set. A good teacher, after few sessions, can realize who are the students who would pass exams successfully in the end of the year, who are going to fail. 
It's not that because a student, you know, because teacher knows the students then have no choice. So if someone fails, cannot say, because my teacher knew, so I had to fail. So that his knowledge would not become false. So, knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or knowledge of anyone else about our choices and our actions is not forcing us. You have always full control over your actions. When, I'm, when I say full control, that means about your decision. I'm not saying you have full control of other people's actions or decisions. I'm not saying you have control over the world, over the nature. But you have control over your own decision and therefore over your own action. Okay, so I think uh, for today this is enough and inshallah ta'ala we continue our discussion, especially we discuss the issue of Qadha and Qadar. And if you get chance, please, you know, study the book in advance, think about it so that you would come to the next session, inshallah, while you are very prefer prepared. Thank you very much. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.